Good morning, and welcome to the uh, Federal Trade Commission's hearings today. Uh, let's get started. This event, just some housekeeping moments for you. Uh, this event is being live streamed and videotaped and transcribed, so your appearance today may appear on the FTC website. If you have questions in the audience today, please write them on some question cards that are going to be circulated and pass them to my colleagues who are going to be collecting them by walking around the room uh, and then they'll forward them to us and um, uh, the panelists can field the answers to those questions. I'd like to introduce our panelists today, uh, starting on my farthest left. Uh, Alex Ocular is a partner at Oric uh, and a former advisor to the FTC uh, Commissioner Olhausen. He's also uh, been a trial attorney at the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. Next to him, Renata Hesse is a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, and she was previously the acting assistant attorney general and the principal deputy assistant attorney general and the chief of the networks and technology section and a trial attorney at the antitrust division at the Justice Department. She's done it all. Uh, and she's also served a tour of duty at the Federal Communications uh, Commission as well. Next to her is Alan, the co-founder of the Concurrence, uh, Alan Grunis, excuse me, uh, the co-founder of the Concurrence Group here in Washington, D.C. He has spent more than a decade at the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. Next to him is John Baker of this very institution that we are so grateful that is, uh, that's hosting us today, American University. He's a professor of law here at the American University Washington College of Law. He's a former chief economist at the Federal Communications Commission, the director of the Bureau of Economics at the FTC uh, when I was there for, for my first tour of duty uh, in the late 90s. And he also served a, in the antitrust, divisions, senior, um, antitrust division of the Justice Department as a special assistant to the deputy assistant attorney general. Next to him is Mike, Mike Bay, a uh, professor of business at Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, a former director of the Bureau of Economics at the FTC. And next to him is, uh, and, and next to me, is uh, Professor Sokol, Daniel Sokol, who is a, a, a law professor at the University of Florida. Um, and he is a, uh, also of counsel in the DC office of Wilson Sonsini. I am honored to have all of you here today to answer the hard questions, um, partly because I want to hear your answers to the thoughtful questions about the antitrust analysis of data, and partly because your answering today means that I don't have to. Uh, Dan, would you like to get us started? We, we, I thought we would start with five minute remarks from each of our panelists and then go to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, American University. Uh, thank you also to the FTC. Uh, overall, I think this is one of the really critical missions that the agency plays when you have very difficult issues to really spend the time and to think them through. Without thinking them through, we have errors in both directions, both, both of cases that we should have brought but we didn't, but also cases where it turns out as we've thought them through, you, you don't bring. And I think, I think both are critically important. Uh, and, and creating a, a framework that you can operationalize is important. I think these hearings aid to that effort. I'm going to bring that kind of thinking, uh, if I may, to the question of big data. So I want to focus on both those words, big and data. Both separately are things that the FTC throughout its 100 plus year history have thought about. For our particular panel, the question is, is there something different when we put those two words together, big data? Um, that is, both as an as a, as a empirical matter, are we seeing something different here that we have not seen before in terms of behavior? And number two, if we are seeing certain things that are different, and even if we're seeing certain things that are the same, is our actual legal framework capable of dealing with these issues? So um, I think there are certain 
differences between big data and what we've seen before. Some of it is simply the amount of data. But what does that mean? I think there's a data ecosystem uh, that we need to understand better. So this includes data suppliers, data managers, service providers, aggregators, platforms themselves, because it turns out all data is not created the same. Its availability is different. Uh, so we also have a sense that big data, there's no one company that can collect all of it. Um, in a sense, not uh, the way we conceptualize oil, like there's a finite amount. No, the, the amount of big data that we're going to have in five years' time, or maybe even three years' time, is literally going to dwarf all the data we've ever had in human history up until this moment. Um, so number one, let's start with what does data mean? We're going to see a lot more nuance uh, because I think that nuance matters when we get to issues of competition. The second issue is what can data do versus not do, big data that is. So a few general points because I think this has direct application to competition law issues. Number one is competitive advantage. Overall, we've seen that it's not so easy for companies to utilize their data effectively. Um, it's not what you do with the data, or rather, it's not how much data you have, it's what you do with the data, where there seem to be diminishing returns on data size, and we've seen that in terms of uh, companies that have lots of data don't use most of it. Uh, and uh, Alex, who's on, on the panel, has, has a framework that, that, that he works through, and, and we can sit and play through some of that. I'd say part of this is well known to people at the FTC because lots of companies have come to you as merging parties and said, wow, if we combine something like our IT infrastructure, we'll, we'll have a lot of value that we'll be able to capture very quickly. We call these efficiencies. In practice, we, we don't see that often because it actually turns out it's really difficult uh, to combine different types of data. Um, so, so that's sort of the first premise. Um, and then even when you do combine it again, it doesn't always work the way you think it does. So the third part is, do we have better answers that data provides? Um, in some cases, yes. Um, and in some cases, might there be new competition questions? Maybe. So I'd say, right now, we still don't have good empirics across fields, law, economics, marketing, management, information systems. It's still emerging. And until we have a robust amount of empirical work, what we have are a series of cases and storytelling. And that makes it more difficult for us to generalize uh, new approaches because we just don't have enough information. As uh, Paradoxically, we don't have a lot of information about lots of information. Um, and that suggests some caution. Uh, that's not to say that you don't take cases seriously, uh, you don't investigate, but it just means that you have to really think through as we, we're going to see in the next panel with regards to remedies. So where does that leave us? Number one, are the general theories of law still workable? The answer is yes. We think by analogy in law. Does this case look like some other case? And the second thing is simply context. Where have we been thus far? When we see the actual mergers to date and conduct cases to date, there has, as of yet, not been a case that's been decided blocked, that is, on merger grounds or a conduct case, where we actually have said um, there's a big data problem that we need to remedy. Thank you. All right, Mike. Absolutely, uh, <clears throat> and let me let me just begin by, uh, by by saying I'm an economist. In fact, just out of curiosity, how many of you in this room are not a lawyer? Would you raise your hand with me? Excellent. So, I've got a handful of economists in here. So I'm going to be approaching things from an economic point of view. Yeah, they're economists because they're not lawyers. <laughs> we, we come in two there, there's only two. There's only two types of people in the world: <laughs> lawyers and non-lawyers. Right. Uh, so, so I, I, so I, 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 I want to offer up I, uh, what I hope are some high-level thoughts that will complement kind of the legal view that, that Alex talked about and talk about the economics of big data. And there are kind of four high-level issues that I think are very, very important to contemplate regardless of how you're viewing big data issues, okay? The, the, the first point I want to make is that the adjective 
big in front of data often conjures up the notion that somehow big data is bad. That same principle applies in other aspects of economics where people think big firms are bad and so forth. And the first caveat I want to offer up is as we're contemplating the, the legal framework with which we evaluate big data issues in antitrust and even consumer protection, that we, that we begin by thinking about non-speculative theories of harm that are cognizable. We typically think about cognizable in the context of cognizable efficiencies, but in, with respect to big data, it's important to recognize that it may be difficult to articulate a theory of harm. Just because something's big doesn't mean there's harm. Let me just give you two examples. So, so one cognizable theory of, of harm might be that somehow big data is going to allow some greedy capitalists to exploit individual consumers by raising prices. That's a theory of harm that you can take to data and determine whether or not prices rise as a result of that data. Okay? An alternative theory might be somehow that big data deteriorates product attributes or quality that you might think of. And the natural issue that you might think about there is the impact of big data and security. Is big data going to be protected? Okay? Those, are, those are theories of harm, but it's important for you to be able to quantify those theories of harm if you're actually going to do things that are in the public interest. Because just because someone charges a high price doesn't mean they're doing something illegal as a matter of law. Charge, being a monopolist is not a bad thing in terms of the antitrust law. You may not like it, but it's not illegal to charge high prices. Competition policy is relevant when two entities merge, and that merger gives them the power to raise prices. Okay? So from the point of view of, of merger analysis, it's important to ask the question whether somehow that merger is going to impact the ability of firms to raise prices. In that context, one might also want to ask the question, if a merger takes place, does it reduce the incentives of the merging entity to protect consumer data? Okay? Those are questions that are economic questions that can be contemplated, and of course, there's alternative theories. On the one hand, you might imagine there are economies of scale in protecting data, and that if you, put, if you have many firms trying to protect data, they're going to skimp relative to what one big firm would do if it were trying to protect that data. That's one theory. Another theory is, gee, if you eliminate competition, then two platforms aren't going to compete in non-price attributes to protect consumers' data. So those are two alternative theories. One says, you know, mergers are bad for privacy. The other one says mergers might be good, and those are things that we can, in principle, test uh, using data. So the big point is it's important to, to, to postulate theories that are testable theories that we can actually take to, take to data, and it's important that we not confuse competition issues with other issues like, like unfairness. Gee, it's unfair that a firm with big data might be able to do a better job of extracting rents from its consumers. Okay? That in and of itself, as I see it, is not, 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 not harm to competition. Okay? So don't confuse those issues. The, the third thing I want to I emphasize is it's important to recognize, particularly in markets with big data, is they're very, very frequently associated with platforms that serve multiple participants. So, for example, Amazon doesn't just serve shoppers like me that spend lots of money on Amazon. It also serves merchants that are trying to get their goods and services into the hands of people like me that like to buy electronic gadgets, for example. Okay? So it's important to recognize that when we're contemplating uh, the potentially higher prices that a firm with big data might be able to extract from consumers because it knows a lot more about Mike Bay's willingness to pay for electronic gadgets, for example, it's also important to contemplate the potential benefits that are associated with that. For example, Mike Bay being to more, e more easily identify an out-of-print book or Mike Bay being able to find a better match for a particular product that, that I'm looking for, or a merchant being better able to match with a consumer looking for his or her, uh, for, for its product, okay? So oftentimes when we, when we do competitive analysis, we're just looking at the price in a market. And I think big data makes that more complex because there are typically more actors that are attached to the big data 
And as an economist, if we're going to do a right job of evaluating whether a particular business practice is pro-competitive or not, it's important to account not only for all the costs, potential costs of that, uh, of that conduct or, or that merger or whatever. It's also important to account for the potential benefits of that. And the last thing I, I, I want to I say is that especially in the big data arena, it's incredibly important to be aware of rent seeking. Okay, because individuals uh, in, in big data markets, when we talk about privacy, and maybe I'll talk about this in a moment, uh, privacy can impact different players different ways. A platform's incentives are typically aligned with the incentives of participants on all sides of the market. A platform's privacy policies may disadvantage certain participants on that platform, like some merchants, for example. But if consumers benefit and if the overall social welfare goes up as a result of those, pri those policies, one needs to take that into account when the whining merchant that's harmed by that privacy policy, for example, comes in and cries foul. Thanks. Right, so two housekeeping moments, uh, a reminder to all of us, including me, to press your mic when uh, it's your turn to talk, and um, a request for our uh, able timekeeper, keep your sign up a little bit longer because sometimes we're so busy we don't have a moment to visualize what you're trying to tell us. Okay, uh, so John, can you please jump in and give us your thoughts on the interest analysis of data and, and perhaps respond to Mike's points about um, the need for theories that are testable and, te testable and the recognition that unfairness and competition harm are, may, may not uh, entirely overlap. Uh, thanks, Gail. I just There we go. Okay. I, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. And no sun in my eyes, not just the... Um, yeah, so thank you, Gail, and uh, thanks to the FTC for uh, inviting me back to the hearings. Um, and uh, uh, for the most part, um, the antitrust conversation about the potential competitive concerns arising from big data is concerned with uh, three areas, uh, privacy is a non-price uh, dimension of competition, which, which Mike talked about, um, potential for uh, close to perfect price discrimination, which I think he hinted at at one point, and the need for access to data as a barrier to entry. And I want to talk about a fourth potential competitive concern, which I think is also cognizable in, in, in Mike's sense. And that concern is exclusionary. Um, it supposes that the uh, a dominant firm has access to more or better data about customers or suppliers than do its rivals. And the concern is that the, the dominant firm will use uh, that advantage to obtain, maintain, or extend its market power uh, by excluding rivals. And to keep my uh, uh, example uh, and explanation simple, I'm going to focus on uh, customer information, but supplier information could potentially be used in the same way. And I'm also going to emphasize uh, just one particular exclusionary mechanism involving targeted price cutting, but there are others, and that'll probably come up in our discussion later. Um, selective discounting is a more attractive exclusionary strategy than across-the-board price cutting uh, because it's a less costly means of e exclusion. And I want to um, I illustrate the exclusionary possibilities of uh, the asymmetric availability of data with two hypothetical examples involving Amazon's shopping uh, platform. And I'm picking Amazon uh, because the examples involving retail products tend to be easy to grasp and they avoid complications that you might get into when uh, consumers are not charged directly uh, uh, for services. But the stories I'm telling here are purely hypothetical. I have no idea whether Amazon actually does any of this, and I'm well aware that uh, Amazon's platform has grown large and successful by providing consumers and uh, merchants and manufacturers with a marketplace uh, that they all value. So the first example uh, is concerned with harm to competition among platforms. So suppose that Amazon can identify occasional Amazon shoppers who, who are, who are, who are they shop occasional on, abs on Amazon, but they're the best online uh, customers of Best Buy, Macy's, Staples, or Walmart, you know, other platforms. And that Amazon can target those shoppers with low prices. And suppose further that the rival platforms don't nearly, know nearly as much about uh, household preferences as does Amazon, so they can't practically target Amazon's best customers in return. 
So selective, so we're talking about selective and targeted price cuts to potential customers by Amazon. Now that might seem like a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to, uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to customers of the platforms that are to the rival platforms, targeted customers targeting them with selective price cuts. And that might seem like a pure benefit to a competition. And in some cases it would no doubt would be. But it could also harm competition when it was employed by a dominant platform to exclude. If Amazon can uh, take away from its rivals a substantial group of their frequent customers, it may be able to raise its rivals' marginal costs of attracting additional sales, and the rival platforms could be led to raise prices to avoid losses, and, or, or they may choose to compete less aggressively with Amazon to induce it to back off. Either way, Amazon might be able to maintain, obtain, extend, you know, enhance market power in uh, online shopping. Uh, and all online shoppers might end up paying more, regardless of which shopping platform they, they use. Amazon might not even need to implement targeted price cuts to induce its rivals to back off competitively, or at least not often, because once Amazon has the ability to selectively target customers of a rival platform that lacks a comp comparable ability to target Amazon's customers, and the rivals recognize that ability, the threat of selective discounting might be enough to induce the rivals to avoid provoking Amazon by undercutting Amazon's prices. And even if the, the threats aren't enough, selective targeting might be an inexpensive exclusionary strategy uh, uh, because the dominant firm doesn't have to reduce its price to its existing customers, uh, only the customers likely to purchase from rivals. And I can spin out a second hypothetical example involving uh, uh, ways in which Amazon could harm competition among firms participating on just one side of its platform that's pretty similar to that, that uh, 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 involving, like, I was going to use an example of the private label diaper business where, uh, where uh, uh, it could target uh, you know, rival diaper manufacturers' customers in sort of a similar way uh, with, with selective uh, discounting. Um, but I see my sign about the time, and uh, uh, we'll just jump on to say that uh, if Amazon, with its uh, superior access to data, is better able than its rivals to uh, identify customers that are likely to buy from others and target them with discounts, um, you know, it could make its rivals less aggressive competitors in just a, whether those rivals are um, uh, sellers on one side of its platform, like, the, like say, rival diaper manufacturers, uh, or whether those rivals are other platforms, which is my uh, longer example. Uh, so you could get prices to rise either just for diapers or platform or across the platform as a whole. Uh, if I had more time, I'd say something about the underlying economics, but instead I'll just simply say that the um, exclusionary potential I've uh, highlighted uh, wouldn't arise unless the dominant firm is less vulnerable to targeted discounting than its rivals. Uh, and an advantage in access to customer or supplier data uh, could make that possible. Thanks. And, and to be clear, we're going to have time to develop a lot of these ideas throughout the course of the panel. Good. So thank you for the teaser. <laughs> that uh, is, a, is a great way to start the conversation. Thank you, yeah. Sure, thank you. Alan, can you um, give us uh, your thoughts on the issue? Oh, excuse me. Oops, my bad. Alan, can you give us your thoughts on the issue generally? And then comment a little bit on the, what you think the rest of the world is doing and um, uh, and and the, and uh, whether you think there's a um, there's a time sensitivity for action here. Uh, sure, thank there you, Gail. You I'm, yeah, I'm I'm trying to keep within the five minutes, and I'll probably fail miserably. Um, so, the first point obviously is that the competition issues raised by big data aren't going away. There are going to be more mergers where data plays a significant role one way or another, um, and there's going to be more occasions to consider the collection use and possible misuse of data when looking at dominant firm conduct. Um, I, I think we also are in a position, I'd argue, a little bit different from Danny in that we're, we're now, uh, we have a growing body of decisions and closing statements, um, so it's possible to look back and see if there are lessons to be learned. You can see DOJ uh, grappling with access to data as a competitive issue in its 2010 closing statement in the Microsoft-Yahoo agreement. 
Um, you can see the FTC staff asking questions about the competitive significance of large volumes of data Google was collecting from users in the, um, the half of its um, uh, staff memorandum that was inadvertently released. Um, th these obviously are not easy issues. They're factual technical and technical challenges to understanding the industries, both in terms of their business models and their competitive strategies. Um, I think there's been progress in the past five years. Um, there's more understanding about the way digital markets work. The German, French, and Japanese competition authorities have produced reports on big data, and the Australian um, authority is in the process of doing so. Um, really great work has been done by the OECD on the digital economy and big data. Um, and then I and Maurice Stuckey hopefully have helped advance the discussion a little bit um, through our book, Big Data and Competition Policy. And so um, it's a long book. I have five minutes. I offer the book as part of the record um, in, in, in this proceeding. Okay, but on the other hand, okay, so in 2016, the then chair of the FTC gave a speech um, in which she said that the 2007 investigation of the Google DoubleClick merger was instructive on how to analyze mergers involving competition uh, uh, between uh, firms with sizable collections of personal data. I, I think that was a step backward. Um, I think I'd hold out that uh, investigation as what can happen if you don't have strong merger enforcement in data-driven industries. Um, um, not only were these two companies in adjacent markets, but they were starting to get into each other's market. So that's that's a big issue here. Um, another issue with that is you had competitors complaining. So, you know, the, Danny says we don't know enough about these markets. Well, in that case, the competitors probably were the ones who knew the most about the markets and, the, and could articulate the, the uh, exclusionary risk the best. But the FTC relegated the views of competitors to a footnote as, you know, it's sort of the usual agency hostility to views of competitors. Maybe not not the right decision. Just last month, uh, Macon Delrahim. So I don't want to just pick on the FTC. Uh, last month, Macon Delrahim gave a speech in Haifa, in which he repeated a number of the myths about big data that Maurice Stuckey and I have discussed in our book, and that most European competition authorities now reject. Okay. So the moral of the story: um, first, read our book. Um, second, the rest of the world is moving forward. And the FTC and the DOJ should not be left um, behind. Um, I'll spend li less than one minute on you know what is big data and is it different. Um, the only thing I'll point out here is there are a number of definitions of big data, but what they tend to have in common are what are typically called the four V's, um, which are the volume of data, the velocity, which is the speed of data gathering and processing, variety, which is the ability to combine data from multiple sources, and value, which is how can you extract commercially valuable information. So um, I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but I do want to get finally to the question of uh, the timing of government action. So assume, assume there's a problem. When is it right to intervene? So. It's an institutional problem with uh, fast-changing industries um, being too late to the dance, all right? Um, you know, this was potentially identified as a problem in the Microsoft case um, that DOJ brought. Uh, you kind of get there, and the bad stuff's already happening. You can't go back in time. Um, Germany recently, the uh, uh, one of their ministries recently issued a report suggesting that earlier intervention may be warranted in um, data intensive markets. Um, and the suggestion there was if, that, if markets are likely to tip to a winner, you know, through powerful network effects, for example, it may be important and appropriate for the government to intervene and challenge any competitive restraints and mergers before that point is reached. If you intervene too late, you can't restore the lost competition. And if you don't intervene at all on the grounds that competition is for the market, you may end up with a persistent market power problem. Um, last thought on this, the argument for earlier interve in intervention may be supported by what's been called the now casting radar, um, which is something that big data enables. 
that's the ability of a company, particularly a platform company, to discover competitive threats at an early stage through data and analytics, and then to take steps to destroy them, uh, for example, merge with them, copy them, whatever, before they've had a chance to take off. Um, that companies are able to move this early also seems to me um, to justify an earlier governmental response. Thanks. Uh, sure, Gail. Thanks, and um, thanks to Chairman Simons and Bilal and Gail and Katie for organizing us and um, and for inviting me to to join you today. Um, listening to everyone talk, I thought it was sort of interesting. That, you know, part of what people are the question people are asking is: Do we need new tools? Do we need to think about data diff markets differently? But the debate that's actually going on here is a pretty classic one between. I'll say ideo do different ideological camps, and I don't mean Republicans versus Democrats or conservative versus liberal. It's just there's a spectrum of views in antitrust about how interventionist competition uh, enforcement authorities should be, and you're seeing that I think play out across um, across this uh, this group of people. Um, so, so just to note, it's sort of it. It sounds kind of like the same debate applied to um, a, a different uh, and new market. Um, <clears throat> so um, I tend to think, uh, I usually find myself in the middle of those two uh, poles, um, and I tend to think that we shouldn't you know, just sit back and not do anything and not think about whether or not these are markets and analyze them. And I, I think part of what the FTC is doing here is making sure there's a forum for us to be able to do that and for us to have the conversation, which I think is an important one to have. Um, I think it's important for competition authorities to, um, to reflect on how they've been doing things and whether or not the, how they've been doing things continues to work. Um, and I think uh, these hearings are a part of a process that's an important one for um, the agencies to go through. So, you know, you've, you've been hearing a lot from <clears throat> this group about what's been going on, and the truth is that there's not that much that has been going on, I don't think, that relates directly to data as an antitrust market. Um, <clears throat> Alan is absolutely correct, I think, to say that the antitrust agencies around the world and in the US and elsewhere have been, quote unquote, grappling with this. What do we do with these um, giant sets of data? How, what role should they have in our, our um, analysis of competition issues? And I think the places where you've seen them uh, directly come into play have not been as a, an antitrust market that's been defined, but instead have been looking at barriers to entry, thinking about exclusionary conduct, um, and potentially considering data-related issues as a component of horizontal competition. For example, um, I think it was actually in the Google DoubleClick, may, might have been uh, AdMob, where um, Commissioner Harbour said, well, wait a minute, we should think about privacy policies and was there competition going on between these two um, agencies around what the privacy policies look like. Um, uh, you know, I think John's right. You can think about exclusionary conduct in this um, uh, context and um, that data does potentially play a role in exclusionary conduct, but I will tell you, having worked on many of the exclusionary conduct cases, at least at DOJ over the years, those are very, very hard cases, and um, which doesn't, say, doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but they are difficult uh, cases analytically, and they're difficult to prove. Um, so, and, and the fundamental reason for that is that the U.S. construct is around what, what Mike said at the beginning. It's not bad for you to have monopoly power and to exploit that monopoly power as long as you didn't get it unlawfully and as long as you weren't doing something with it that's bad. Um, and that's how, you know, traditionally we thought about exclusionary conduct. Um, so there's, there are lots of questions floating around. Um, I'm a believer in using the competition toolbox where it fits, but not trying to stretch it to places where it doesn't fit. And I'm not sure we know exactly where data fits into that, um, 
into that paradigm? Uh, does it fit in, into the normal paradigm, or are we trying to stretch it out, stretch the paradigm out um, in a way that maybe doesn't work? Um, I also believe, like, and this is going to be a little bit at odds with what Alan said, that um, that notwithstanding the fact that markets, dynamic markets, do change very fast, and therefore there is some uh, possibility of uh, things happening before the agencies um, can get a handle on them, that that it's also important to have to to approach markets like this carefully, so that we don't um, disrupt the the innovation paradigm. And I think with that, I will stop. Renata, thanks so much. All right, Alex, um, I know that we've been talking a lot about competition law, naturally. I, um, I think that you've said you wanted to address not just competition law, but also matters of consumer protection law. So can you give us your thoughts there? Great. Um, thanks a lot, Gail. And uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to American University and to the FTC for uh, holding these important hearings. Thanks to Bilal and to Dan and Derek, um, Gail, uh, to the FTC staff for the tremendous job you're doing in organizing these and for inviting me to participate. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to take a step back, as Gail mentioned. I'm going to talk a little bit about some guiding principles and also about some analytical frameworks to consider when discussing issues related to um, data analytics. Um, as, as I think Mike mentioned, you know, big data offers enormous commercial promise for the economy. A lot of people, including McKinsey, have estimated that the uplift to the economy will be in the trillions of dollars. And we can already see some of this occurring with a lot of the apps that people have today, personal digital assistance and the like, um, as well as in the commercial context. Uh, analytics have been um, tremendous in wringing additional efficiencies out of, for example, the retail supply chain. But big data also presents you know, some highly publicized potential risks, including to personal privacy and in some circumstances, potentially to competition. So in the face of this breakthrough technology and the dynamic changes um, that are going across industries and across markets, um, in my, from my perspective, it's imperative that antitrust enforcers maintain uh, enforcement policies that continue to foster competitive dynamism and innovation in these businesses while still protecting consumers. This is best achieved by creating at a high level and maintaining a stable enforcement environment that offers predictability, transparency, and fairness to all stakeholders. Those are the hallmarks of good government. And by applying traditional antitrust analytical tools and principles, including the consumer welfare standard, to d reduce the likelihood of over-enforcement, particularly in situations of speculative or difficult to ascertain harms. So now, more specifically, I'd like to go through and outline very briefly two enforcement proposals for analyzing big data issues um, in keeping with the aforementioned goals. Um, and, and these are, these are um, models or, or frameworks that I've had the good fortune to work on with um, multiple and uh, distinguished colleagues. So first, when an enforcer is confronted by a harm that touches on personal data, one of the initial questions has always been which body of law is best suited to address that particular harm. And this is a particular issue within the FTC, given the agency's broad mandate. Given the enormous volume of sensitive personal information being absorbed and used for data analytics, in some industries in particular, many enforcers, academics, and consumer advocates have suggested blending consumer protection, privacy, and antitrust, as we've discussed a little bit earlier, um, earlier this morning. So while, while concerns about abuse of uh, personal data are understandable and important, Former Commissioner Olhausen and I suggested in a 2015 article that it would actually be most effective for antitrust and privacy in particular to remain in separate spheres, except to the extent that privacy protection is an existing dimension of competition. We offer a three-step analysis for agencies to consider in choosing between antitrust and privacy or consumer protection laws as a matter of institutional preference. So first, you ask, what is the character of the harm? Is it commercial, personal, otherwise? Harm to consumer welfare or, or maybe economic efficiency is better addressed through antitrust, whereas personal individual harms are likely better addressed through consumer protection or privacy laws. Second, you would ask, does the harm arise from the terms of the particular bargain struck between an individual consumer and the company? Does it go to the integrity of that bargain? If so, then, then it's likely that a consumer protection or privacy law is better equipped to address the problem. And then finally, we would ask, does the remedy that's available under the law effectively address the potential harm? 
and this goes a little bit to what we were talking about with, with Google DoubleClick, double but if an agency were to block, for example, a merger out of concerns that a merged data set would create privacy problems, it would likely not stop the ability of the parties, the very same parties, from sharing that very same data by contract. However, this sharing arrangement, if it violates the privacy policies of the parties or the terms of use, could be a Section 5 violation. So turning from this first framework, which is a, sort of a high-level framework to decide between which body of law, um, if you assume that, that an enforcer chooses antitrust, uh, there's a second framework that I've worked on <clears throat> with, um, in, in an article last year with Greg Savinsky and Lars Kilby. Uh, we outlined a four-pronged analytical screen within antitrust uh, for determining the competitive significance of data that tracks the logic of these prior matters that antitrust enforcers have already brought by treating data as an asset for analytical purposes. And within this rubric, we ask, first, do the parties own or control the relevant data? It's unlikely that you would have a competitive problem where the relevant party is only a processor, for example, of the data. Is the relevant data, second, is the relevant data already commercially available as a product or as an input for downstream products? The agencies have a lot of experience dealing with these types of situations. Third, is the relevant data proprietary and captive to the owners or controllers own products and services? These are the more complex questions, but it's difficult to see where a captive data set um, could, that is not currently available to third parties in the stream of commerce is likely to present a competition issue. It's, it's difficult to see that scenario. And then finally, is the relevant data unique or do reasonably available substitutes for the data exist? And this has been the key question in a number of cases brought by the agencies, including Thomson Reuters and others. So using these screens would help maintain doctrinal stability and continuity in antitrust as well as other laws and provide good guidance for market participants and promote continued predictability, transparency, and fairness in applying the law, which I think is critically important where you have this type of dynamic change across multiple industries. Thanks so much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Terrific. Thanks, Alex. And I'm not letting you off the hook so quickly. I want to ask a question to you um, about sort of the maybe about the premise of our conversation today about the antitrust analysis of data, particularly big data. Um, just a housekeeping matter, this is the Q&A portion of our panel, so I'll be pitching questions to our panelists. This is your time to write in those questions on those note cards and pass them forward, so we can uh, we could be happy to entertain those too. So Alex, let me just quickly ask you, what do you think of the uh, notion of generalizing about big data. Some of the panelists today have already alluded to the notion that not all data is equally valuable. Should we be asking about the antitrust analysis of big data, or data generally, or should we instead be asking about the competitive harms that come from the use of data? So I, I would tend to hew to the, the latter question, looking at harms. I think that um, you know, for purposes of, of panel discussions and the like, it is, it is easy parlance to, to refer to big data um, very generally. However, um, it really isn't accurate to say that all data is created equal or that there's something unique in particular about the sheer size of a data set that makes for a unique competitive problem. Um, you know, first, there, there are numerous different kinds of data, and not all data are fungible. You have behavioral data, you have transactional data, you have uh, ambient or, or environmental data. They're all fundamentally different forms of data. And the value that is associated with data depends very heavily on its intended use, right? So not only is the data characteristically different or can be characteristically different across different types of data, it also depends upon how someone is going to effectively monetize or use that data where you might have a competitive issue. Um, some data actually has no commercial value under, under virtually any circumstances. Some data has commercial value only for a limited period of time. I think um, Alan was talking earlier about volume, velocity, variety, and value. Um, you know, data, data is only good for, it can get stale, um, some of it very quickly. Um, and at that, after that point, it has no commercial value. So, so associating that data with other data does not necessarily mean that you've changed the competitive dynamic in any given industry or market. Um, one of the things to really look for is, you know, most data is an input into um, machine learning or into AI, and that's, that tends to be how it's monetized through those analytics. The, the, the type of data that's desirable for purposes of most analytics is data that provides a multiplicity of signals 
and that offers multidimensionality for purposes of dynamic experimentation in machine learning, meaning that the machine learning is going through and looking at different patterns and different scenarios within the data to arrive at some type of, an, go through an analytical process and arrive at some type of a work product. And so having different forms of data is critically important. The other point to make, make here is that the agencies have looked at data um, Deal, you know, deals involving data, deals involving data markets, many, many, many times. And what has been most critical in each one of those um, deals, for example, a Thomson Reuters um, or, or Dun & Bradstreet QED, which involved a merger of two companies that provided educational data, um, is whether or not the data sets actually have reasonable substitutes. Are they somehow very unique? And given the fact that, <clears throat> and, and what, what we mean by unique is, not just are the data themselves unique, but is, is the data actually something that could be collected reasonably by another competitor? Is it, as they say, non-rivalrous? Is it non-exclusive? And very often, data is. So those are all considerations that have formed part of the analysis that the agencies have gone through, both in looking at mergers and then in conduct matters. And <clears throat> in those circumstances, they've been able to arrive at what I think are um, reasoned and thorough uh, examinations of the, of the markets and conclusions that, at least for purposes of some deals, remedied the potential harm. And they didn't have to or didn't have to modify or think about their analysis differently by virtue of associating the word big with data. It's really just data. Thank, thanks so much. I, I want to build on one of your observations in asking a question of, of you, Mike. Um, Alan mentioned that you know, the, the question is whether data sets have reasonable substitutes or whether they can be easily collected by a rival. So there's been some commentary around the concept that, you know, there's evidence that consumer, that a suggestion about evidence that, they're, that consumers may not, um, uh, may be pretty readily willing to trade loose data policies for lower prices, for better services, suggesting that uh, a rival could do just what Alex suggested, which is collect the information afresh. It, so uh, two questions for you. Is that true uh, in, in many contexts, any contexts, all contexts? And then does that make a difference to the question about whether a, whether and how a rival, sh uh, whether in preventing a rival from collecting data amounts to exclusionary conduct in any case? Uh, <clears throat> great, great questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, clearly, if consumers don't value privacy or they're not willing to pay higher prices to preserve their their, their purchase behavior, for example, it's it's going to be hard. Uh, it's it's going to be hard for a market to sustain that wish of consumers because ultimately, if you believe in markets, uh, you know markets are ultimately going to attempt to provide those goods and services that consumers want. Uh, and I think that's one of the one of the tensions that we face as we contemplate privacy is that, you know, we're all very different. I remember when, when I was at the FTC, Debbie Majoris was chairman, and I remember her telling me that, you know, she'd give up her DNA to be able to get at the front of the security line, right? That's her choice. But I bet there are people in the audience that would not be willing to give up anything to jump to the front of the security line, right? So when you have heterogeneity among people, it's very, very difficult to design a privacy policy that's going to meet the needs of everybody, and therefore it's going to be diff difficult for a market to generate the privacy policies that do that. So, so the question then in my mind becomes exactly the exclusionary question, which, I, which I, mean, I, I, agree with, I agree with John's theory. He proposed a theory where there could be exclusionary practices that, that raise prices, and I also agree with Renata that it's not unique to data issues and that it's very difficult to disentangle kind of the targeted price cuts that John was referring, uh, referring to, to legitimate trying to steal customers from a rival to increase your market share through legitimate business means. So they're difficult to, to entangle those things. But, it, but in terms of, of the foreclosure story, I, I think the foreclosure story in, in, in markets that involve big data, and in particular big data on platforms, is, is far more complex than the standard types of foreclosure stories that we, that we all know can, can, can lead to uh, a firm excluding rivals and therefore harming consumers. And, 
And the difference is it's not like this, this great gold bullion that we're going to call big data is something that the firm, you know, built a mine to get. You know, it's not a physical asset. It's an asset that the firm somehow collected from individuals. The only way you create big data is somehow attract consumers or induce consumers to turn that stuff over. I'm assuming here we're not engaging in, you know, fraud or deception, something like that. So, so just bear with me for a moment. So in an environment like that, if, 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 a, if, a, if a competitive platform is at a disadvantage with respect to the data that it has, one hypothesis is it's at a disadvantage because it's not creating the value that consumers need to turn that data over in the first place, right? So it's easy to cry foul, uh, but it, it's, it's not at all transparent that that, that, that foul is, is due to anti-competitive behavior. In fact, it could just simply be that, that the platform's offering lots of value. And I don't know how many of you folks in the audience use, use you know, Google Maps, for example, but I'm, I'm very, very careful with what I turn over to platforms like Google. But I tell you, when I need to get somewhere quickly, I, I, I adjust my privacy settings so I get optimal information from Google about where I might stop along the way for gas and stuff. And that's a, that's a conscious trade-off this rational economist makes, right? So. Uh, fair enough, Renanda. Let me ask you uh, your thoughts on whether we should be using, we at the agencies, we at the courts, should be using data as uh, defining a relevant antitrust market as data. Is that appropriate in a merger context, in a non-merger content context? Can you think of examples where a data market has been used as, uh, as uh, in, in, either by the agencies or by the courts in this setting? So um, before I get to that, um, I just commenting on this discussion, I mean, I do think there's an element of the bigness of the data sets that, you know, that is relevant to how people feel about their impact on competition. So I tend to agree that, you know, you, it's data is different, but I also think that part of what people are worried about, and again, the question is whether antitrust is the right tool to, to uh, address that concern, is that these data sets are so big that they make the machine learning dramatically easier, or they make the artificial intelligence that much better, or price discrimination that much better. So, so the bigness of the data sets isn't just a, a fun word to use. It is actually relevant to what the concern is that people that, um, that are, that's arising. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think you can't answer this question in the abstract. Um, I think is, <laughs> is the right answer, right? Data might be a product market that one could define, um, but it might not be, and I think it depends on what the transaction is, what the parties are, and when, you know, what their products and services are. I, I don't think up to this point people have focused on data itself as a relevant product market, but rather have been thinking about it as um, an, an element of competition and an element of, uh, you know, potentially uh, that impacts the competitive analysis. So looking, thinking about Microsoft LinkedIn, you look at the EC's 61C decision, and you can see they're thinking about the data that LinkedIn has and whether or not that's going to be a problem when Microsoft acquires it. But it's not that that's the product market that they're focused on. And I think up to this point, that's, um, the, that's largely what we've seen. So you know, you would have to have a transaction where the asset that is being acquired or the product that is being acquired is actually the data. Um, and I think we just haven't quite seen that yet. I'll ask an unfair question predicting the future. Do you, do you reckon we'll see a case like that in the future? Or can you hypothesize, you know, a theoretical case where that might be appropriate? And Renata, you, you, I don't need to put you on the spot if your colleagues want to jump in with answers here. They should feel free. I, Looks I, like Alan. Alan's well, got I, th it. I think okay. the FTC has defined yeah, um, uh, data as a product market. So, Alex, maybe you can tell us a little more about the case or cases. Where sure. No, and, and, and maybe I'll just qualify that. So, I, I don't know that there's been any definition of sort of a big data market. Um, I'm not aware of that. But there, but there have been cases where data is being monetized as a product, and the agencies have defined that as a market. One of the examples that, that I gave was um, done in Bradstreet and QED, which is a merger it was about five years ago or so. 
Um, you know, and in that matter, the, the parties were selling K through 12 educational data, and so that was, I think, the market that they looked at. So there, there are some examples of that. Um, the Thomson Reuters, it was um, sort of, it was financial data, financial products that were being sold to analysts. Um, and in that circumstance, the, the DOJ was particularly concerned because um, there, there, it was because in part because of the size of the data sets that were required, um, how unique the data sets were. The, the companies had to gather historical data. They had to gather data across uh, the world in all different jurisdictions. They had to interpret that data through um, different accounting standards to make it meaningful for financial analysts. And so all those factors went into the, the decision matrix, and ultimately they decided that these two companies were the only ones that provided those particular data products, and as a consequence, the deal would be a problem. Yeah, I mean, so I, I tend to think of those, and perhaps incorrectly, those cases as being about services that enable, that use a lot of data to provide uh, information to consumers. So I don't think about the, but but maybe that's not the right, maybe that's not the right way to think about it. Obviously, the data is important, and in a lot of a lot of financial services markets, you see that that people are. But when I think about Bloomberg, for example, I'm not thinking about the data that Bloomberg is collecting. I'm thinking about the service that Bloomberg is providing, clearing trades and things like that. So it's it's, a, it's almost like a distinction between maybe like the raw data, right. right, versus data that has actually been turned into a product, right. right? So it's been transformed in some way. I think maybe right. is one way to think about it. Just um, jumping in for just a very quick intervention. So the other thing there is it was historic data that on financials that went back literally roughly a hundred years. That's not what these hearings are about. We're talking about, if I understand correctly, like information that's collected daily, if not by the minute. Um, that, and, and so the, the thing that made that a unique data set is not typically what we're thinking about when we see any number of companies collecting our data based on our location as closest to whichever cell phone tower we're at or what app we're opening, et, 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 et cetera. A question from the floor that is in this vein I want to interject with. Can, they, can, can greater data collection be considered tantamount to an extraction of higher prices? Does so, anyone want to jump, jump in on that? So th uh, this, this is, it's a really interesting um, question. Um, you, can, you can think about um, data as currency, and I could give you an example of where, you know, that's not metaphorical, that's real. You know, you, your terms of service with some online platforms say in exchange for this service, you, have an, you will do something for us. It's, it's a financial exchange. You could, you could think about data as currency. You could think about um, giving too much data uh, as being equivalent to a price increase. It, you know, I don't... It might be hard to model it, especially in the free setting, but there's no reason you couldn't. Um, the, 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 the thing is, I think in the U.S., w we, we don't have this idea of exploitative monopoly or exploitative um, abuse of dominance. And if, if, if you do, you know, as Europe does and a lot of the rest of the world, it's, it, I think it's a little easier to get at these issues than under the, the U.S. framework, which is, you know, exclusion, collusion, predation. But, but, but I mean, I could think of, I mean, for example, if you're looking at competition across, you get two firms and they have different uh, policies about how they collect data and what they do with it, you could envision thinking about a price increase being possible if one of the firms has a dramatically different policy about how they use or extract data from, right? I, I think you could fit it into that. I think you're saying that, but it's, yeah. it seems like, but again, you're sort of fitting it into the framework that we already, the existing framework that we have and thinking about, um, you know, I think people think about qualitative um, features as um, competitive effects. So increases in quality, decreases in quality, innovation, all of those things. So the the way you extract data seems to me like it could just fit neatly into that paradigm, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I concur. That was kind of what I was trying to imply at the beginning, right? If you, if you start out with a firm that already has big data and is using that to charge high prices, higher prices to extract additional rents, 
unless there's foreclosure or something else going on, that's not enough under competition law. But if two firms merge and you combine the two, the two data sets and because of that you can enhance the prices that you're charging, I mean, that's anti-competitive. The, the merger is leading to the combination of assets that allow, allows the, the entity to raise prices. If there's some offsetting benefits to that okay. raising of yeah. prices, then you've <laughs> okay. got to take that into account. That's the two-sided market story that I was telling earlier. But, but that's why you don't focus on just one side of the market. You've got to look at the entire, the entire benefit. But, but I thought I Renata's that point was that the, uh, uh, the merger could lead to worse privacy policies or something like that so that and that's in effect an increase in the quality adjusted price and so you don't it's not the price per se that you necessarily have to focus on it's the you can think of uh, what I uh, uh, competitive effects in terms of quality adjusted prices for example I just want to mo note that one I mean one one practical difficulty that I think someone had mentioned is just how, how do you actually assess the change in, in, in price, assuming that the ex extraction of data can be analogized to a price or an increase in price, um, you know, how as a practical matter do you actually, you know, put that into an antitrust analysis and make, make sense of it? Let me ask a question about that antitrust analysis and, and ask you, uh, Alan, about the, about data as a barrier to entry, right? We've been talking about data using metaphors like currency. Uh, viewing data as an input, um, does it matter? It, 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 can a firm's data set constitute a barrier to entry for purposes of our antitrust analysis? And if, it's, if it does, does it matter how you got it? We've talked about getting it through merger. Does it matter if, you're, if the firm spent a lot of money and resources building and developing the data? Does it matter if the data was developed internally versus, as we said, in a merger or an acquisition? Does it matter if the data is non-rivalrous? And as um, uh, one of our questions from the floor has asked, you know, can be, can be generated, a question from the floor posited, pretty easily by a new, by a new company. Uh, do those points matter when we're thinking about data as a um, barrier to entry? So if, if, I, if, I had a, if I had slides, if I had done my slides on time, I would show a slide um, that shows a castle with um, moats, and I kind of think of the moat, the moat as potentially barriers to entry. I'm not an economist. Economists think differently. Um, but in, in the slide, you know, there are a number of things like, okay, two-sided markets, you know, getting it all these other sorts of things that, that could become barriers of entry. But data is also one of them. Even, even, if data, um, even if data tapers off at some point, data is listed as one possible barrier to entry. But I think, you know, in, in answering your question, really you gotta, I, I would, I, I'd first say, um, you know, this also is case by case. You can't, I don't think you can make any rules that one size fits all. Um, if data is a critical input, you've got um, examples of the FTC's um, Nielsen Arbitron case where the FTC has an entire section describing the barriers to entry there and why they're high. Um, same thing if you go back a number of years to the um, European case of um, TomTom Tele Atlas, which had to do with um, digital mapping. There's a discussion of why those are high barriers to entry. And they're, but that, those are the cases where the data is a critical, you know, can be, we call it a critical input, right? So the, the, the another and, you know, more challenging question is, okay, what about things where um, you don't think the barriers to entry are high? You know, where somebody else can, can get access to the same data, and maybe, maybe they are. You know, geolocation, for example, doesn't just come from one source or, um, you know, where a user can simply click on or select a different app. Are those, are those situations where barriers are, are high? And the answer is, well, you know, they look like it, they're low, but they could, but it could, they could be high. Um, you know, I, I, one easy example is, um, is search, okay? So when Google started to do search, it didn't have a lot of data. Um, it was essentially developed in somebody's garage, okay? Um, after a while, um, a 
another competitor, you know, if you wanted to develop a search tool, um, good luck uh, competing with Google. Um, Microsoft's Bing, for, you know, as far as I know, is still losing money, okay? And it's the second largest um, search provider. So there's something in the ability to scale up um, that makes barriers to entry higher, okay? That's point one. Um, point two is when data is involved, there may be additional um, reasons to think barriers to entry are higher. Um, data related barriers to entry could extend to things like algorithmic learning by doing. You know, the more data you have, the, the, the better your product is going to be. Now, that's a product attribute, so I'm not saying it, it's a bad thing, but it could turn into a barrier for somebody else to enter. So, please. Yeah, yeah I, so I, I get a little bit uncomfortable in this area, in part because I feel like if you're picking on Google, for example, you know, the reason why people use Google search generally is because they like it better. If Now, you, one could argue, potentially, that, um, uh, and Google is not a client. Um, former client. It's a former client, but it's not a current client. And I'm not saying this because because of that. Um, you know, that the, the fact that they have all this data makes it easier for them to be better. But this goes to, you know, right to the question that, that I think Gail was asking in part, which is, does it matter that the, whether the firm spent substantial resources develop, developing and building them, right? So are, this is when I start to worry about, you know, are we gonna punish someone because they did a great job, they, developed, they got a lot of data, so they have a great product that people like, and if people didn't like it, it is really easy to switch, right? It's not, it's not hard. So, there, so I mean, I, I, I kind of take your point that the barriers to entry look low, but for whatever reason, you're not seeing people switch. And the question is, does that have something to do with what, um, again, we're picking on Google here, but you could apply this in any other market. You know, Is that because Google's doing something that they shouldn't be doing, or is it because for whatever reason, the other product just isn't as good? So, uh, so let me just respond briefly, and, uh, you know, and I don't mean to pick on Google, um, but you know, there is a record of looking at Google on these issues. And so if you look back at the Google double click merger, um, one way to characterize it is Google had a lot of data about where users went when they searched on Google itself. And double click had a lot of data about where people went when they went elsewhere on the web. You combine those two things and it's potentially game over. So for, for competition, okay. So maybe this does come back to the question of did you do it yourself or did you develop it through mergers? Maybe it comes back to the question of if you're gonna look at mergers, should you be focused on mergers in a product market or is there something about data where you've gotta look at adjacent markets or nearby markets kind of the way Europeans I think have, have done it a bit. Maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, Renata, but No, no, I think I, I think I think this is, that's a different, you know, a different panel discussion which is, you know, are are the agencies doing a great job looking at potential competition and are they getting at that well enough and Google double click is an example of a merger that people like to talk about is you know, along with Facebook, WhatsApp, you know, did did the agencies miss something there? And again, I think that's these are all conversations that it's good to have and I think it's good to think about. Um, but that doesn't strike me as fitting neatly into the exclusionary conduct kind of paradigm, but, but more by acquisition. Okay, yeah. so I guess the, my, my last response will be to say our old agency in Bizarre Voice, um, you know, took a merger between people where you'd think the entry barriers were low, but the, um, the market participants thought they were high and successfully challenged it. Bad documents. <laughs> well, bad documents or no documents, it's sort of the same theory. So, right, yeah. okay. Can I just Danny, make did you want to? Yeah, just two, uh, two okay. things. I want to just bring it up uh, to, to, to a more theoretical level. So we say that data is the new currency. So let me actually work you through a thought experiment. Let's call this currency cash, right? So 
if we had one company acquiring another company that had a lot of cash, would we block the merger merely because there was more cash? Actually, I think what the agencies do correctly is say, what are the competitive effects? Cash itself is not what matters. It's what you can do with it. And then actually, to Alan's point of do we have you know, uh, a series of cases? We do have an emerging series of cases. And in fact, if we don't look at what competition authorities around the world have done in terms of their discussion documents, but in terms of the actual cases, let's just, again, big picture, look at these. Have we seen any deal blocked because of a data barrier to entry? The answer is no. And in this, there's no difference between the EU and the US. If we look at the big you know, cases involving all your platforms, <coughs> Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google, et cetera, these deals have gone through, right? Um, so the, then there go, takes us back to the, to the next question. So is the framework wrong? Because here would have to be wrong both for us and the Europeans on this issue. Could be that the framework is working and we haven't actually seen in reality these kinds of data barrier to entries in practice, acknowledging on a theoretical basis that they may in some cases exist. Danny, why Pigeon. isn't Bizarre Voice an example of a, a merger block because where data is an entry barrier? So I'm actually with Renata that these were bad docs more than anything else. Um, but isn't the theory still that but th this was include all that it was difficult for other firms to enter? Uh, so so th th this was, I'd say, not a big data type merger, the way we're thinking about big data. The, the way that, 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 that is not you and I, but overall, when the Wall Street Journal or Forbes or what have, or what have you covers something called big data, Bizarre Voice is of two uh, small companies in a non-reportable <coughs> transaction. I don't think that that's what they're thinking about. They're getting at people to, to give up their ratings and reviews. That's, you know, personal uh, views about products, and that's what was hard for someone else to replicate. It's not literally, you know, personal uh, demographics or something, but, but it, it doesn't have the same flavor. I think it's a, it's, it's a little bit different, but I think the case also would have looked different, but for the fact that literally I can't imagine a single case in U.S. antitrust history that had worse smoking done documents. Can I just, I just want to add very quickly. So I would be very concerned about over enforcement in this space and chilling innovation. I think that data gathering and data analytics are certainly forms of innovation. And I would really be framing this more as an analysis or discussion of innovation competition and thinking about, for example, in the merger context, whether you, um, the merger of two parties, whether there would still be sufficient number of parties innovating in the space to maintain competition. That's how I would be framing this and thinking about it. Okay. Can I, can oh, please, one, please, one absolutely. More thing? Just, just uh, not, not to take this very interesting conversation, but I, I just want to remind you as an economist that there, there's some old literature that grew out of the, 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 the AT&T case when AT&T was ultimately you know, divested into the 13 baby bells. And that literature is, is on, there's a, there's a great little book called Theory of Natural Monopoly uh, by Sharkey. And that, that literature really builds out the whole notion for the structural environments in which you're going to end up with one big, one big player. In, in that world, it was the old landline world that has now been supplanted by by wireless towers and so forth, but to the extent that you view data as a barrier to entry, the, one, of the, one of the potential reasons, and I'll just throw this out, for it being a barrier to entry is that there are economies of scale and economies of scope in collecting data. Economies of scale talks about the depth of data. The more data that you get, the easier it is to utilize that data, the more you can do with it. The economies of scope is about the breadth of the data don't only have detailed data about, about Mike Bay, you have, you have, you have data about, uh, from John and everyone else in this room, that's breadth. And you know, as you collect that, you, you do better. And I, I remember being at an economic conference five, five years ago maybe, 10 years ago, somewhere in that ballpark when Hal Varian and Susan Athey, they, at the time Susan was chief economist for Microsoft and Hal still is chief economist for Google, were arguing about economies of scale in search. And Hal was arguing 
that ah, you don't need large, large numbers, you know, the law of large numbers come in, and he talks about T statistics and stuff, and tries to make the argument that you don't need, you don't need a lot, lot of searches to get good results. Susan, Susan comes back and says, well, it's really all about the long tail. You know, it's true that there's a lot of searches that a lot of people do, and you don't need a lot of information on that, but when, when Mike Bay wants to find that bizarre book that only Mike Bay wants called David's Order Statistics, you know, there's just not a lot of searches for that. And so if you've got one player that, that kind of is a monopoly for those searches, it can do more than someone else, and that gives Microsoft being a disadvantage. So I'm not coming up with Microsoft's good, Microsoft's bad, or whatever, but that argument, it seems to me, is just the reality that, you know what, we'll get better search results if we got some bloody monopolist have all our information. Now, there may be consequences from that that we don't like from a public policy standpoint, right? But, you know, forcing Google, and again, I'm just throwing this out, not because they're paying me because they're not, it's just, just an example that we all get, forcing, you know, Google to turn over its data to, to, to Microsoft so that each of them have half the data doesn't necessarily make us better off as consumers. Yeah, you get more competition, but neither party can then operate on the long tail, right? So, so it's, it's a complex issue if it's structural. If that's the reason that we have big data concentrated in the hands of only a handful of players, there may be a structural reason for that. And there may require other, other, other remedies to remedy social problems that we perceive. So, John, let me ask you a question. May I just, I, want, say, just want something to yeah. what Michael yeah, said before we do please. another, which is uh, I'm not quite clear on why you th what you see as the relevance of Bill Sharkey's book about natural monopoly, because if we're talking about, you know, well, you can think of, uh, you know, network effects as, you know, scale economies and demand, and we have scale economies and supply, which is prep more, and scope economies, which is more what he was worrying about, but, but you can have, uh, uh, there are uh, some settings where the scale economies are so powerful we have natural monopoly and then we regulate them. There are other settings where multiple firms uh, can achieve sufficient scale economies to compete um, and uh, maybe it's only a handful, and then we have kind of an oligopoly market, you know, relative to the size of the market. That is, that is to say, multiple firms can achieve the scale economies given the scope of industry demand. You know? And then we have uh, an oligopoly market, and maybe there are only two. Uh, and then we have other settings where lots of firms can get sufficient scale economies, and then we don't worry so much. And, and I wasn't sure that you were trying to argue that um, Google was a natural monopoly or simply just observing that you might have a market where only two firms could achieve sufficient scale economies uh, to compete, and and that maybe Google still gets more than Bing, but there's diminishing returns, and Bing has enough, uh, and you get competition. So, so how you come out on there's like a empirical question about what actually the scale economies are and what the implications are for comp for market structure and competition that you have to resolve uh, uh, before you can figure out what the right antitrust response is. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with anything you said. I have not conducted such an empirical analysis. What I was pointing out, though, is that, that Susan Athey was suggesting that Microsoft's Bing wasn't big enough to get the kind of economies of scale that they needed. So, I mean, the, I'm, again, I'm not trying to put word in either of their mouths. I'm just trying to point out, hypothetically, if it's a structural issue, then it's a structural issue. Let, let's deal with that and, and, and figure out how best to deal with structural issues than, you know, try to, you know, prevent firms from becoming big because it's, because big, big data is a bad problem. You lose the benefits associated with that. That's the, the dialogue between Susan and Hal was, was about that, so. So, John, let me ask you to help us switch gears slightly. You've got a question from the floor. John, about the selective discounting theory you, you put forward. Now, so I want to talk about data as a competitive advantage. Um, so the question from the floor is, you know, understanding your hypothetical about selective discounting as something you could do if you have a critical and well-managed big data set. The question is, why would such um, uh, selective discounting be bad for consumers? Or are you, uh, are you implying a look to other doctrines like predatory pricing or something like that to find a harm? Oh, it, it, it could be uh, bad for consumers if what it does, if the consequent, but first of all, selective discounting can often be good for consumers. And I'm not arguing otherwise that, that uh, because that could be a way in which competition happens. 
but it could be bad for consumers if, uh, if it operates to exclude rivals. How could it operate to exclude rivals? Well, it could operate to exclude rivals by um, either raising their marginal cost of getting new customers or, or discouraging them from being aggressive comp uh, competitors. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Vare's analogy to the chain store paradox, let's say, and, you know, in the, uh, uh, in, in a, in predatory pricing literature, but it's, but a firm can uh, threaten a rival with, or, or even just entry deterrence uh, models uh, generally. A firm can threaten a rival with aggressive competition and uh, induce it to back off. Um, and that's what it could do with selective discounting. Uh, so it's not, there's nothing unusual about the, the theory. Uh, it's, it's well within the four corners of what we um, think about with exclusionary conduct generally. But does, does it have to fit into the predation? I mean, what's the, what's the framework you use to analyze that? Because what you just described sounded like the American Airlines case, which was a predation case that DOJ lost. I'm just curious. I'm not challenging the theory. I'm just wondering, like, how do you, how do you judge whether the selective discounting is anti-competitive or pro-competitive? Oh, well, you have to, uh, I mean, the, the, the issue is, uh, um, uh, has to do with the rival reactions. It's, it's if, if the, uh, um, you know, in some markets everybody competes more aggressively and, and, uh, and everybody selectively discounts to, you know, each other's customers and, and uh, you get uh, very competitive outcomes. And in other markets you could get something like what I was describing as possible, which is yeah. the rivals back off. And, and that's, I mean, what, you, I th if you're asking as an economic matter, we don't necessarily have to call it predatory pricing or exclusionary conduct or anything. If you're asking as a legal matter, then you get into to what, whether it's what piece of the doctrine applies, and that's kind of a different question that I wasn't focusing on in, in what I was saying. Any thoughts or responses to that? Okay. Uh, let me uh, change now slightly to a new subject, mergers. And Danny, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about this. We use the word data in the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines, but not in the way we're using it today. Are the horizontal merger guidelines from some eight years ago flexible enough to do the job now to handle database theories of competitive harm? Uh, in short, the answer is yes, but, but actually let me just go back to what we've been talking about here to give you this proof of that, which is in every single case that we've been talking about, we've been analogizing back to other cases involving data, to other cases involving exclusionary conduct or predatory conduct, and we have specific cases in mind, and we say, does this look like this other case enough that it gives us a theory of harm that is potentially winnable in court? I, I think very effectively, uh, but by the way, I say humbly on the same panel as one of the authors of the leading antitrust law case book, um, what I would say is, is there, the, the basic question you have to ask is the following one. Is there something, some theory, that we're not seeing uh, by the agencies and or by the parties that's not happening in the merger guidelines? That's, that is to say, is there something in practice that is different than what the merger guide, the, the, how the merger guidelines in practice are working? Is there some kind of dissonance? Or in the alternative, if we assume that the merger guidelines are actually not reflective of practice, but are aspirational of the practice that we want to see, is there something that seems to be missing from the merger guidelines in the way that we think about it? Well, every one of our theories we seem to have been evaluating in mergers, I have yet to hear something incredibly new that the guidelines haven't thought through at, as of yet. And I'll just leave it at that. Well, uh, I mean, we always proceed by analogy to past cases, and so there's nothing new about that. And, and but, but for what it's worth, the merger guidelines are focused on um, you know horizontal mergers, and the the harms are uh, either uh, coordination or these unilateral effects. But it's basically, in some broader sense, collusive. 
you know, counting unilateral effects collusive, and it's not really focusing on exclusionary issues, uh, for example. And so that's why when we, why when uh, we talk about uh, we, we gravitate the closest we get is when we think about exclusion as a barrier. To, I mean. Um, data as a barrier to entry. That's how, we, that's how we got there in this conversation, uh, that because in the merger analysis, uh, uh, that's what sort of looks like exclusion. You know, but uh, you could also worry that acquisition of data would do just what I was describing, selected uh, uh, targeted discounting. It could allow, or, you know, or there are other kinds of exclusionary conduct uh, that uh, involving big data that you could worry about. So it's not so different from what I was arguing about, about target discounting to say that the merging firm uh, uses its, the merge firm can use its data to better uh, emulate the product's characteristics of rivals and exclude them that way uh, um, by, uh, you know, through, you know, it'll have the same pros and cons. That looks like competition. You're giving consumers better products, but it also could be a rapid, uh, you know, emulation of, uh, of rival products, uh, you know, could also be a way of excluding rivals and forcing uh, you know, rivals to back off competitively, invest less, and that sort of thing, too. All of these things are um, exclusionary theories uh, that aren't really well developed in the merger guidelines and are potentially available as a merger theory. We have fewer than five minutes left. I want to throw out a very practical question to this panel because I know some of you have already told me you have thoughts on the question. If we're going to take big data seriously. What questions should staff at the agencies be asking to get evidence on the big data questions you've been talking about today? So can I jump in on this one? Um, all right, so what sort of data are we talking about? Is this industrial or personal? Is it user generated? Is it observed? Is it inferred? How does it contribute to the rationale of a deal? What does the acquirer intend to do with it? Um, in a lot of these deals, I suspect the answer is, I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm going to figure out how to monetize it, um, but that's a legitimate question. How replicable is it? It's a question that we've talked about today. What, what uh, stops the acquiring firm from getting it without the merger? Okay. And what sort of data assets do um, competitors have? I think those are some of the staff questions, and I'm sure Renata's old section asks those questions routinely. One problem for the agencies is if you have one section asking those questions, but you've got other sections that also have data issues coming in their mergers, how do you transfer that knowledge over to the other sections? Just real briefly, regardless of whether it's a consumer protection matter or an antitrust matter, I would, I would say make sure you're looking at the appropriate actual world and the appropriate but-for world. Because the tendency is, for example, to contemplate what the world might look like if it were perfectly competitive. How happy would consumers be? And that's not generally the correct but-for world. So thanks, Gail. All I would say, or all I would add to um, to what Alan and uh, Mike said is that I would really focus on because those are questions that we would ask in in in, in Renato's old section, and um, you know, really focus on whether the data itself is unique, truly unique, like in a Thomson Reuters situation, and whether that would enhance the ability, the market power, or the ability and incentive of the merged parties, for example, to to exercise market power and raise prices somehow. Very quickly, because that, that's all really helpful. We didn't talk about efficiencies. We, we might also want to consider those. I guess that's implicit in what we're saying, but let's, let's make it explicit. Are there a different set of questions you'd be asking to elicit that information, or is it the same sort of suite of questions that's been outlined already? So I, that about right. So I. So efficiencies are always difficult. They're difficult conceptually for courts. Um, quality efficiencies, to you know, something that Alan talked about, particularly difficult for courts to understand. On the agency side, you, you all get it better um, than than courts do. You 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 have frameworks. You you have a way of getting at these questions. I and I think. Dare I say it? 
the agencies typically do a really good job. To the extent that people complain at the spring meeting, it's about one case, oftentimes, which they were involved in. Um, you know, and, and, but, but overall, you know, I think we should recognize also when agencies do it right. The framework seems to overall work. The, the methodologies seem to work. Th this is an area, there, there are some areas I do have more concerns with others, but the ability of agencies to sift through information, including thinking through efficiencies, I, I think the agencies do this well. Danny, thank you for that uh, closing and optimistic note. Uh, let me ask everyone here to join me in thanking this extraordinary panel uh, for their thoughts this morning.